worked with them a couple of months uh, to uh, uh, to help them uh, go through their archives, also taking pictures and doing interviews with some co-op members. And so that has been part of my field work. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, so I wanted to introduce you to the puzzle that I started with for this paper. Uh, and it is basically about the tension uh, around the role of management structure uh, in housing cooperatives. Uh, and these are excerpts from a 1971 uh, journal uh, about housing co-ops uh, that shows that there were really tense and different positions uh, about the role of this type of management structures. Uh, so here you can see in the first except, uh, some of us argue that the existing co-ops should unite into a federation and pay for its time chiefly for the purpose of expansion. Uh, so this is an argument about how having staff uh, in uh, managing several housing cooperatives uh, would be important. Uh, and in the second paragraph, you can see student co-ops, the controversy between management versus membership control is well known among co-ops, uh, whether or not and how balanced power is established is of crucial importance. Uh, criticism was leveled at large co-op planners uh, for caring little about the social aspect of cooperation. Uh, so we can see that even in the 70s, in early 70s, uh, this kind of tension existed about how to handle uh, the development of uh, several housing cooperatives and whether having staff and having this kind of overarching um, management stru structure was the right solution uh, for these housing cooperatives to develop. Uh, so if I introduce you a little bit uh, to my theoretical puzzle, uh, so we can see a contradiction and a tension uh, between uh, the desire to have horizontal self-managed and grassroots organization uh, and the potential desire to expand, uh, to have political impact within society. And I know that uh, this game of themes is also very uh, common in the work on the workers' cooperatives. And so there are different strategies of expansion that a grassroots movement could use. Uh, they could engage in prefigurative politics. Uh, they could try to scale up. Uh, they could try to scale out, uh, so having more structures, or they could try to engage in other type of collective actions. Uh, but uh, the scaling up solution, uh, for instance, has some problems because uh, what looks like a good way to resolve problem at one scale uh, does not necessarily hold uh, at other scales. Uh, and so has, uh, scaling up can uh, trigger quite a lot of different problems, uh, especially because it might require a form of uh, what uh, David Harvey called nested hierarchical structure of decision making uh, rather than direct negotiation between the individuals. So for the cooperative model, this is especially challenging uh, because it uh, begs very important questions of governance. Uh, so the risk, uh, if you don't, do not expand uh, in a way that is uh, respecting this principle of horizontality and self-management is to lose a member's sense of empowerment, uh, ownership and responsibility, uh, and it could lead to potential apathy and degeneration. Uh, so this is the starting point uh, where I was when I got interested in this topic. Uh, and so I was working on uh, developing case studies uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my methods. Um, so I basically studied uh, student housing cooperatives in North America, uh, which are self-managed housing structures uh, that bloomed in many American college town uh, following especially the 1968 movement, even though I could find uh, traces of this type of movement since the 1930s. Uh, and they provide affordable housing for students uh, and build space for prefigurative politics. Uh, so this is a definition given by Altus and John in 2003. Uh, my data were uh, coming from several sources. Uh, I did uh, conducted over, I think now, uh, 40 interviews with people from housing cooperatives, uh, all from their meta organizations, so the, from the management structure that managed several housing cooperatives in a single city. Uh, I also conducted participant observation and I tried to work as well with archives to see how these questions were asked uh, historically. Um, so just to give you an outline of the presentation, uh, I will first introduce you uh, to my uh, theoretical discussion, uh, give you some background on the case study and try to highlight some of the main findings that I'm currently uh, grappling with. 
uh, and I'm describing how this kind of management structure that I called a uh, meta organization to refer to some uh, organization theory uh, that are currently uh, working with, with this concept, uh, try to perpetuate grassroots project despite uh, the vagaries of student lives. Uh, then I will talk to you about the tension and piece of, of student housing co-ops uh, and this type of meta organization and also trying to find how this uh, housing cooperative are trying to find solution, uh, resisting the drift toward management control, for instance. Um, so uh, one of the tension is uh, between having collective uh, empowerment or having uh, intermediaries play a role. Uh, so students co up are a form of community-based grassroots organization. Uh, and one of the political uh, source of efficacy for such form of organizing uh, depends on the process of collective empowerment uh, that occurs through face-to-face -face interaction, which creates a collective responsibility and accountability, a sense of solidarity uh, and democratic decision-making. Uh, and all of this can be in tension with the idea that cooperative uh, needs infrastructures and intermediary to thrive, uh, sustain themselves and expand. Uh, so I think this can be related to what I've been written around the degeneration theory says this in worker cooperative, uh, with this idea that cooperative expansion entails a contradiction uh, with core cooperative values. Uh, and uh, an analysis of how this kind of hierarchization processes come back uh, through different ways uh, in alternative organization. Uh, so hierarchization can come back through formalization, representative democracy, or full control by management. Uh, and so in the case of workers' cooperative, this has been described around uh, exclusion from ownership from some members, uh, shifting of priorities back to capitalist goal, a recreation of managerial hierarchy, uh, etc. Um, how this manifests in housing cooperative is, to my knowledge, less studied. Uh, but what we know about housing co-op is that they sometimes refuse to scale up uh, uh, because they want to avoid being uh, caught in capitalist logics. Uh, so this kind of looks uh, like what we found have at worker co-ops. Uh, there is in an interesting branch of literature on the scaling up processes uh, in uh, for housing co-op. Uh, so scaling up being the horizontal expansion through the creation of new groups uh, while maintaining the small scale of individual groups to preserve their responsiveness uh, and accountability to individual loyalties. Uh, but my question was like, do we scaling out operate in a vacuum or are they some type of infrastructure that is helping the scaling out process? Uh, what I found on my field work is that there are actually this kind of cooperative meta organization or umbrella organization that are kind of uh, coordinating this effort for scaling out. Uh, and so I was trying to study the dynamics of accountability and adjustment to such umbrella organization. Uh, and I'm curious to see if it is similar or different from what has been studied in other types of co-ops. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of context uh, on housing cooperatives, uh, there is indeed a big expansion that have been happening for quite some time. Uh, so this is uh, an excerpt from a report from 1943 uh, from the US Department of Labor, uh, where they describe how uh, housing co-ops first got uh, created for students. So a small group of students pulled their meager resources together, rented a house, and begin to furnish their own meal in order to, so that they might continue their education. Uh, and they already describe uh, expansion processes uh, between uh, uh, 1933 and 1941. Uh, from that small beginning, the group had expanded it by year, reaching a membership of over 650 in 1941. It has taken over one after the other five apartment houses, converting the apartment into sleeping dorms for the members. All of the buying is done through one office uh, and the house is prepared in one kitchen. Uh, so this is the description of uh, the development of a housing co-op system in one city uh, over 10 years. Uh, but this type of things happen in a, a lot of different spaces in a different periods as well. So this is also from Altus and John, where they describe how this also happened in the university around the University of Michigan. Uh, and it started in 1937 with three houses and now has uh, over 600 members in 19 locations. 
so same similar type of uh, sprawling expansion around the city. Uh, same in Berkeley. Uh, it started its first house in uh, 1933 and then uh, no house, so now in 2003, over 1,200 students in 20 residences. Uh, same thing in Toronto. Uh, so this kind of growth uh, around student uh, type of uh, town, college town, uh, is actually quite frequent. Um, and so what I was interested in is was to study what were this kind of things. So the intercooperative council, uh, the university student cooperative association, and what role they play uh, in this type of questions. Uh, so in the part one, I will talk about how meta organization uh, sought to perpetuate grassroots projects uh, despite uh, the short term and vagaries of a student's life. Uh, so some of my findings from conducting interviews is that uh, students co have a number of challenges. Uh, first, uh, they face an important turnover because college life is usually like for, for four years. Uh, and uh, this turnover can create changes in group cohesion, a challenge in establishing a house cultures and ongoing policy, and can lead to this kind of reinventing the wheel uh, on a fairly uh, recurring basis, so having to reinvent solution uh, uh, to problems that have already been fixed in the past. Uh, students' uh, life also makes it so that uh, there is important vacancies during summers. Uh, there is an uneven commitment of members. Uh, there are economic liabilities. Uh, and it's also for students uh, their first organizing experience. So there is a learning curve to manage finance and maintenance uh, in housing cooperatives. Uh, they also might have to manage crisis, which they are not necessarily equipped uh, to do. So in terms of fire and water damage, um, managing debts, eviction, uh, drug dealing, etc. Uh, someone in an interview mentioned how their co-ops forgot to pay property taxes, which uh, put them in a difficult situation. Uh, and there are also limited financial capacity for students. Uh, so they can have some challenges to secure mortgage, uh, to respond to hard uh, and some challenge through uh, expansions as well. Uh, so what I found uh, was interesting is that actually uh, meta uh, organizations, so this kind of uh, inter-cooperative councils, uh, were helping on quite a lot of these different challenges. Uh, so, for instance, they try to create a handbook uh, to avoid reinventing the wheel and try to create a culture of the solution already created by individual co-ops. Uh, they try to keep track of the rules and policies that uh, had been created in the past. Uh, they created the training, uh, especially to manage finance and maintenance, and so, or sometimes they had specialized uh, staff who could handle some of this, and therefore the co-op would outsource uh, this management to uh, the meta organization. Uh, they could be uh, responsible in part for the economic liability and try to find solution. Uh, some housing co-op, for instance, hosted, uh, became kind of hostile during the summers uh, to try to avoid uh, economic challenges. Uh, they were considered to be more uh, able to talk to bank uh, and therefore be more credible to secure mortgage, for instance. Uh, they were trying to find solutions to a lot of different hardship uh, and notably around COVID as well. Uh, and they also could uh, develop expansion policies uh, beyond the capabilities and financial capabilities of students. Uh, so they could be a, a little bit of the institutional memory of co-ops and remind them that uh, some milestones such as paying uh, taxes uh, and could be in charge of managing some of the crisis. Um, so this might look a little bit like a perfect picture, but I'm going to talk about the drawbacks that were mentioned during interviews as well. Uh, just uh, to give you one short example. Uh, so this is an excerpt from an interview with a student member of a co-op and they say, uh, one of the uh, student housing co-ops didn't enforce the rule, didn't keep the co-op running, didn't keep it clean, too many drugs that can be tolerated starting showing up. 
it actually became enough of a liability that the management uh, board of directors didn't renew the contract of anybody living there at the end of the year. At the end, everybody was moved out of the co-op and the co-op was shut down. I think it was closed down for a solid year uh, to get cleaned up, redone and reopened. Uh, they closed everything, one, done, chased everyone and changed the name because it did get that bad. Uh, and it's the only time that it happened. Uh, so this is kind of an extreme case, uh, but uh, this interview it took it as an example of how meta organization could get involved in uh, 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 re-establishing a co-op when there are too many challenges. Um, so part two, I wanted to talk about the tensions uh, and pitfall of uh, having this kind of meta-organization uh, take charge uh, of housing cooperatives that are supposed to be grassroots and member-led. Uh, so uh, I took notes of the different type of challenges uh, that uh, were mentioned with the uh, interaction in, with the meta-organization. Uh, so there could be a lack of transparency, poor communication, uh, bureaucratic hassles of policies and concentration of power. Uh, Co-op members also deplored the fact that some uh, meta-organization got enmeshed too much within the co-op's internal affair. And I think the former example is a good example of that. Uh, they described tension that could result in a shouting match or dramatic exit during meetings. Uh, they mentioned how sometimes uh, meta organization could curtail the voice of individual co-op members, uh, and they refer to a series of scandals or abuse of power by executive directors, such as salary, corruption, embezzlement, uh, or eviction. Uh, it could be a disconnect between the staff of the meta organization and the co-op, uh, and the conflict of uh, member recruitment, selection, education, and dismissal. Uh, so, for instance, some co-ops uh, desire to keep uh, students once their studies were over and therefore they were no longer students, uh, but some meta-organization uh, didn't like that, so this was a recurring theme of tension. Uh, and so there were tension in four uh, out of the five cases uh, of meta-organization that I studied uh, for this specific paper. Uh, again, the risks are many, and people mentioned disempowerment during my interviews, disengagement, and also apathy, if you don't feel empowered enough through your co-op, uh, because there is this uh, meta-organization uh, overseeing what you're doing, and which creates all of this conflict, uh, this is a risk. Uh, so just to give again one example, uh, this is an interview from a student who was also a board member of the meta-organization. And they said, uh, we function as a cooperative. We have a board of directors. We have no landlord or anything like that. But the membership didn't know that it was a co-op. Uh, we had students coming through. And it was a result of the board of director uh, that had a very firm grasp on power for a long period of time. So they ran it very uh, autocratically. Sorry. The same person was the building president for 11 or 12 years. Uh, and he was in less party and a fire captain. He had no interest in promoting cooperative awareness or making sure that we were contributing to the greater cooperative community. His interest was being uh, the king of the building essentially and creating rules for himself. Uh, so this is an example of someone uh, uh, being uh, angry that the recruitment was not handled through the co-op itself, but through the meta-organization, uh, and also what it created in terms of new members not being aware of what a co-op would entail and just being here for the cheap housing solution. Uh, and so my part three is about uh, how uh, this type of uh, housing cooperative tried to resist the drift uh, toward management control. Uh, and one solution that came up uh, very frequently was education, uh, both the education of new members, so try to create this type of orientation event to introduce them uh, to the core principles, uh, the political socialization and critical thinking uh, development of these new members as well, uh, as well as education of the staff and the board. Uh, and also recruiting staff for the meta organization who have experienced housing cooperatives and were knowledgeable about them and enthusiastic about them as well. Uh, there were also dimension of renegotiating jurisdictional control within this housing cooperative. Uh, so for instance, there were important movement for internalizing back membership processes. Uh, 
So uh, members of uh, housing co-op wanted to have a critical mass of cooperative minded people, even though they were also interested in recruiting people who could be initiated to these principles. Uh, they often refused the eviction of former students uh, and uh, they wanted to reintroduce members' active participation in house management. Uh, so they moved from hired managers to elected officers uh, in some co-op uh, to take back this type of ownership. Uh, and also from paid labor to volunteer labor to bring back this kind of horizontality in the structure. Um, they also reclaim more internal decision-making processes. Uh, and they looked for restructuring and dissolving the board when uh, this was not functioning well. Uh, and sometimes they even fired executive manager of this uh, kind of meta organization. Uh, so mostly they were trying to delegate back most of the power of the housing co-op uh, at the co-op level and not at the level of meta organization. Uh, and what is interesting is that it's not a static process, but it was kind of a dynamic back and forth where at some point uh, meta organization could have too much power uh, and then uh, it could be renegotiated within the co-op ecosystem. Uh, also as an exit strategy for like former student co-op members uh, who wanted to uh, be more independent, they could also create independent co-ops, uh, which happened in a lot of different cities uh, where there, there were this type of a, a housing co-op uh, system. Uh, so just one example, this is an interview with a student member of a co-op uh, who was a representative in the meta organization board. He said, now we are in a slightly better place. Our policies are more coherent. We have figured the best way to do most of this stuff uh, is to explicitly download responsibility as far as we can to the house level so that the board and the staff doesn't even have to think about them and they just happen. The only time that there would be a problem is if, is if people are trying to do something at the house level they don't have the budget for. Uh, which is why we are also trying to move as much of the money decision to the house level as possible. So here we can see this kind of dynamics process of giving back more of the power uh, to the individual housing co-ops. So as a quick conclusion, uh, uh, this shows kind of complex interdependencies between individual housing co-ops and the meta organization that are trying to put them all together. Uh, this kind of co-op management structure appears to have been a catalyst for uh, students' co-op success in North America, uh, but we could see some forms of degeneration in the student housing cooperatives. Uh, uh, and uh, so this could uh, translate for, into feeling of disempowerment, uh, the feeling like you don't have the power to choose your own housemates to take decision for the house, uh, to choose how to paint your wall or to spend the house money. Uh, this could lead to disengagement and apathy. Uh, and in that type of cases, uh, interviewees mentioned how co-ops could turn into dorm, uh, so lose sense of empowerment and communities. Uh, and someone else in an interview said, without the member of volunteer labor, the housing becomes too expensive, the commitment of the member declines, uh, the member education becomes negligible, and the understanding of member control is insignificant. Uh, so this, is a, uh, this also shows how scales do matter, uh, because uh, the delegation of work can only work uh, if there is mutual recognition. And also this is not a linear process, uh, but dynamic process of gazing, gaining and losing control uh, between these two different uh, level. Uh, it also wanted to uh, give me the incentive to draw conclusion on uh, the notion of productive conflict, uh, because the conflict that I mentioned in part two where VHA called for the political socialization and critical awareness of many of the come up member interviews uh, and it recreated a sense of ownership and entitlement to democratic voice. So the main barriers to democratic control seems to be the short term stay of members um, uh, and therefore uh, they needed more time for political socialization which is a long term process. 
uh, and it also highlighted the key role of education to cooperative principles. Uh, no, I'm happy to have any comments that you have, and I'm uh, still very open to reading suggestions because I'm sure some of it is already well known in the literature on workers' cooperatives. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. As I put the message on the group, I think you had your last slides. That was good timing. Um, right, can we have a show of hands for some questions on this uh, subject? You can just use the raise your hand function on the reactions tool. Um, right, uh, we've got UK Society for Cooperative Studies, <laughs> one of many. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I'll change my name uh, so you can see again. Um, yes, thank you. I mean, that's a good continuation. I think you presented last year as well, didn't you? So maturing of the study. Um, I was interested in, it sounds like you've got a, a housing co-op equivalent of Cornforth's paper, 1995 paper on not just uh, uh, challenging the degeneration thesis or identifying the degeneration thesis, um, but the regeneration thesis as well. So, mm -hmm. um, have you have you written something that that run sort of looks at the parallels with Cornforth's work in ninety five? Uh, I should definitely check it, the regeneration <laughs> thesis. It seems yeah, like this is what I'm trying to talk about. I mean, he, was, he was using case studies to work at courts where there's been regeneration or redemocratization. So it sounds like you've got something very similar to say in, yeah. in the context of housing courts, which would be great. It'd be a great addition to the literature. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rory. Um, any other questions or reflections? Um. Ah. Do you want to go, Roger? Yeah. Um, thanks, Lisa. That that was really really good stuff. Um, seems like you have very um, comprehensive uh, analysis, and and it's sort of very seems very well li linked to to the literature. Um, <clears throat> I I think um, the 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 re there's not a lot on the regeneration thesis, and it's always been a um, I had a PhD student who, who, who looked at um, how do social economy organizations maintain their values, um, a guy called Mike Aiken. Um, mm. uh, so if you want to read a thesis, <laughs> there's, that, <laughs> there's that one. Um, but uh, I was going to sort of say something which is... is um, it might sound a little strange, but I, I've been doing stuff on scaling of, of social enterprise. You know, why why do they sometimes not re, not replicate a, a model and uh, which seems to work in in different contexts? Um, and there's a there's an old French sociologist called Tarde. I don't know whether you know him. T A R D E, and he he was around the same time as Durkheim, and uh, he's suddenly become a little fashionable in this area, as well as there are many French sociologists who are fashionable these days. Um, and his um, his approach is to look at uh, imitation and innovation together. So sort of the, there are patterns of imitation uh, that uh, the sort of streams of innovation that inform the a sort of replication process. And there is, there's also the potential for innovation and it struck me that because you have, um, you know, the turnover of, of students quite, quite, uh, quite regularly, uh, there's a sort of there are issues about replicating the model, and and so I don't know whether, you know, whether that sort of the the work of Tarda, the sort of link between imitation and innovation, might offer an insight into, you know, why some of them. Uh, kind of don't imitate the good parts of what happened before, but imitate something that uh, you know is from from somewhere else, uh, which 
doesn't doesn't work uh, within the cooperative frame. Anyway, that's my my contribution. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Thank you very much for your comment, and uh, I'm very willing to read your uh, student thesis if you want to share with me the reference. Uh, I would be happy to have a look. Uh, and uh, this question of why do not pe uh, do people not imitate? I think my first uh, idea is that uh, sometimes they are not aware of what happened ten years before because they have only been around for two years or so. But uh, I think there are also deeper question about why you wouldn't want to imitate what has already been uh, done. So thank you very much for your comment. Um, let's hear a question from John. Hello, for fellow cooperators. Can you uh, possibly hear what I'm Very saying? quiet, John. Yeah. Right, in which case I will, Rory, step up my uh, Southeast London school teacher voice. Um, I'm never quite sure with these things where my Quaker stillness uh, elides with my um, southeast London school teacher stuff, but I'll do the best I can. Is that better? It is understandable. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, the um, I was going to thank this um, our presenter here, and I'll give my thanks and apologies to everyone else and explain why the, I'm so later arriving in this uh, highly nourishing environment. Um, the contribution that I'd like to make with this is, is a couple of resources, one of which has literally just arrived um, at my front door um, from the Peace Pledge Union. So here is a box of white poppies. I don't know if uh, many of you know the history of this, but within the pack, um, and I encourage you to buy some for November, is an educational booklet. And it's the only place that, um, as if you're prepared to flick through and know what you're looking for, it's the only place which points out that the White Poppies were an initiative of the Women's Cooperative Guild or the Cooperative mm. Women's Guild in 1933. Now, when I ordered this pack, I expected that there would be within it, um, the leaflets which told people that, but they're not there now. So here's my um, second piece of corporate degeneration, because that's what our presenter was talking about. And incidentally, I lived in the Quarry Housing Cooperative in Ottawa, uh, not as the registered tenant because I was unemployed, but my then wife was the registered tenant because she had a job. But by that time, I was a member of the Cooperative Party. And the Cooperative Party on its membership card says, in effect, and I won't turn it back, we as cooperators aim to establish the Cooperative Commonwealth. Now, even though I've been expelled from the Cooperative Party for being anti-Semitic, we have the circumstance that, first of all, the Cooperative Party in the southeast of England has produced a membership card which has no statement of values or connectedness with any aspect of our global cooperative movement. It went through an, a, an intermediate iteration where the original statement was, was replaced. So let me finish with this. For those of you who are looking at, at corporate degeneration, I would say this book, The Spirit Level, which I hope you've all seen and you've all ingested, tells us that as income inequality increases, everything goes to hell in a handcuff. That's true in the um, cooperative sector and within the housing cooperatives that you just mentioned. Um, and it's interesting that those uh, US student cooperatives that our presenter, and I apologize, I haven't got her name directly in front of me, gave us a beautiful example of the way that the solution is to flatten and decentralize. Of course, capitalism, as she mentioned, a beautiful phrase, uh, capitalism needs to reestablish the hierarchy of management. 
And if this present era is an example of that, well, I just don't know what it is. So thank you again for, uh, for that presentation, such a, a nourishment to me. Thanks for that um, contribution, John. Just a, a quick suggestion to the organizers, all these wonderful resources and references that are popping up, can we possibly collate them in some way and, and share with this uh, community? Um, I think um, we have... I, th I think the, yes. chat, the chat stream, I think, will be saved along with the video. So um, if we publish the chat streams too, then the commentary will, will uh, appear. It'll go awesome. a long way. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rory. Well, All thank right. I think you. we have time for I think we have time for just one more. Uh, Ian, have you got your hand up? I, I spent a lot of time, I must admit, during the talk, trying to find the reference to the early student, student cooperator in uh, in Edinburgh, a biologist called whose name I found, Patrick Geddes. I don't know if you've come across him. But he, oh, yes. he, he regenerated a lot of the uh, properties in Edinburgh for low cost student accommodation. And then he inducted these students into sort of utopian socialism and probably got into a lot of trouble for it. But I think he was around in the early 20th century. So anyway, Patrick Geddes. Thank you. Let me check it out. Is there anything, uh, Lisa, that you would like to say in closing? Uh, well, thank you so much for all the references. I will echo what you just said, Nicola, about uh, I try to write down the names, but uh, I would be grateful for references in the chat so that I can actually make sure that I can find back all the references. And thank you, Roger, for uh, sending out the, the name of the uh, thesis. Right. Uh, so I think if, if that's us for Lisa's session, um, then we can probably move on to John's. John, have you prepared a presentation for yours? Yeah, yes, I have. I've got a, a paper manuscript and um, it's okay. incredibly shorter than last year's one um, because I realise that everyone will be keen to get their, um, their dinner or their travel arrangements or their childcare and grandchildren arrangements. To hand. So as I did last year, I shall skip through this. Would you like me to wait until 25 minutes past? I, I don't think that's necessary. I just wanted to find out if you have a slideshow you'll share or are you reading from your paper? No, I'm, re I'm reading from a manuscript. Okay, so thank I you. I think it? you can begin. Okay, in which case, first of all, um, I sat down over the last couple of days and tried to condense all of these books and resources into, a, into something that would uh, keep people awake right at the end of a three-day conference. <laughs> and what I'm pre presenting uh, now is a follow-up to my paper of last year, which was called uh, The Objective of the Cooperative Movement as the establishment of a global cooperative common wheel composed of local and national cooperative commonwealths. And then a lot more blurb because Southeast London school teachers can talk at great length, as many of you here will know. So my paper this year um, starts off with an apology. First of all, I apologize that I haven't been in the conference um, in live. I shall try and pick some of it up in the recorded sessions um, because here in Littlehampton we have established uh, a local completely non-federated uh, guild of cooperators, the Littlehampton and District Guild of Cooperators for peace and the common good and wouldn't you know it today is the town show where we're launching our, um, our new local guild because we are sick and tired of centralized organizations. Um, as the previous speaker said, if you give your power away, the power of agency to a bunch of criminals at the center, uh, they will use that power to beat you over the head. So again, I hope that you've all had a good conference and you'll tackle the year ahead uh, refreshed in our cooperative identity. 
Um, last year, I pointed out that the earliest example of economic cooperation um, and one born in adversity, which is a key aspect, was the 1860s, wrong, 1760s, uh, Woolwich Shipwrights Cooperative. And that was mentioned and described in this book, Masters and Journeymen. So I'm relating that back. But of course, you will wish me in a historical context to look further back. And so I've looked into two places. First of all, um, I've increased my overdraft by buying a copy of this book, which is a history of cooperation in the United States. And it's important to recognize that even by 1870, people within the United States felt there was a need to write a history of cooperation. And interestingly, at the beginning of this book, it points out that at that time, the word cooperation in the United States was um, written without a hyphen. So some of my cooperator friends will know how passionate I am about the hyphen, but it included a diuresis or an umlaut in German above the second O. And it was pointed out that that was there in order to say the word co-operation as two distinct uh, voice sounds equivalent to the hyphen. So if that's the case that we were looking that far back, can we look back even further than 1760 with the Woolwich cooperators and the 18... We lost. With, uh, my we lost you, operators in Sorry? We just lost you. Did I uh, lose you for 10 seconds? Yes. Okay, we, not to worry. That was just a piece of luck. You disappeared. Um, John, do you want to try turning off your camera if your connection is a bit dicey? I, I could ha yeah, happily do that. So uh, I suggest turning that. off your camera if the connection is a little unclear. Okay. Yeah, there we go. One of the circumstances about being on the edge of the planet, which is definitely what Littlehampton is, uh, is that <laughs> our internet isn't as far, fast and speedy as everyone else. That's why we have to do it locally. So I've looked back to try and discover even earlier um, forms of cooperation, because it's one of the assertions in this paper that cooperation is inherent in the human characteristic, in that we all are social creatures and we all have a need to be loved and to produce uh, what I would call wealth, other people would call it wealth, uh, in a social sense. So along the coast from here is the fifth continent on the planet uh, called the Romney Marsh. And the Romney Marsh is an extremely precarious um, uh, environment. Uh, it's been subject to being completely sculpted out by the Western Gales and the longshore drift of the English Channel. And so the communities on uh, the Romney Marsh and that area of Southwest Kent um, produced legal forms which have been copied elsewhere in order to uh, collectively and cooperatively produce the sea defences, which even to this day mean that parts of the Romney Marsh, which are very, very fertile, are actually below sea level. Um, it's definitely one of my um, uh, favourite places to be. So is there a take home message then from this paper? And the take home message is something which I hope my fellow cooperators will accept uh, with reflection rather than in anger. And I will say that the take home message is Pete Seeger's song. I don't know if many fellow cooperators recognize Pete Seeger's name. And he wrote a song called, Which Side Are You On? 
So the question for us is, are we on the side of cooperators and movements that are endeavouring to replace capitalism with the cooperative alternative? Or are we simply hoping to find hideaway holes within the hegemony of capitalism where we can uh, hopefully imagine that we are cooperating with our fellow cooperators? Now, I have to make that challenge because one of the books that arrived recently, and of course you can't see this now, is E.P. Thompson's uh, Customs in Common. And on the back blurb, it says 18th century Britain saw a profound distancing between the culture of the patricians and the plebs. Well, bluntly, if that's not what we're in at the moment, along with uh, the security services uh, recording every word that we say by video or phone or even in face-to-face -face conversations, then we really are in the most awful t times. This is the new fascism. Um, and the behavior of the government in Australia is the most egregious, outrageous example of that. So to the body of what I'm saying, and as I say, this is really quite short. Um, I've mentioned this early form of, of economic cooperation through social cooperation on Romney. So I don't need to mention that again. And um, I can move really to um, the excellent response by the Woolwich shipyard um, workers when they, out of adversity, built their own cooperative mill, they established cooperative shops in Sheerness, in Deptford and in Chatterton. So does that mean that now in our own time, we can simply work to create um, what may, one may call a cooperative sector composed of social enterprises? Or is it time for us to strike out into clear water and speak about Uh, we've lost you again there, John. Cooperatives as socialist enterprises. Because that's what the original... Um, so, just to finish with a um, couple of paragraphs. I am a, 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 a great... It's breaking up, John. I have a great interest in a concept called liminality. I don't know if this word is... I'm not sure he can hear Are us. You... Um, he actually dropped off. Are you back with yeah. us, John? Oh. No, you're muted. muted. I've asked him to unmute, so he, he'll get a message. Okay. Thanks, Rory. How's that? Uh, we can hear you again. We, 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 you were breaking up for about a minute. You were okay. the last thing that I made a note of that, that was clear was that you were saying, "Are we trying to create a cooperative sector of social enterprises?" and then. You, you seem to develop the argument towards socialist enterprises, but we didn't get the detail of that. Right. So um, uh, what I was saying in the end of that segment, which is the penultimate statement in this paper, that the time I think has become necessary for us to speak of um, um, cooperative socialist enterprises as a direct alternative to capitalism. And interestingly, up at the Littlehampton Town Show and Fun Day, which is still going on, and I must get up there by um, certainly about five o'clock. No, I said I would be there at six, so we have ample time. 
Um, that message was very, very well received by anyone that stepped up to our um, Guild of Cooperators stall. So I think we're pushing against a door that's all already wide open. If we speak about our plan for cooperative socialism and of cooperative socialist enterprises. And of course, those enterprises are, are examined in the plan for cooperative socialism and in the read on cooperative socialism that the CCPA published in May uh, 20. Uh, we've lost you again, John. Are you are you back with us? It's in the papers section at CCPA Cooperative, but also to say that one of my personal interests is in the concept of liminality. Now that's a word that is perhaps not particularly familiar, but a liminal space is the space between uh, two states. So for example, um, a beach between the high water mark and the low water mark is a classic example of a liminal space. But sometimes it has the characteristics of the land and sometimes it has the characteristics of the sea. As a physical organic chemist, I would say that this has a direct relationship to transition state theory and the question of whether or not a transition state is a coal, which you may recognize is a geographical term, a shallow valley uh, at high level between one um, deeper valley and another deeper valley, or whether it is um, the top of a mountain where you can only slide in two directions. In a coal, you can rest in at the top of a mountain, uh, you will slide one way or the other, either back to the original place or to a new place. And so I think that we are in a state of hope because we have the concept of a cooperative commonwealth as a national entity, of a global cooperative common wheel as um, uh, an entity which is not only based in hope, but is based in practice, which replaces the state of fear with the state of wellness. So in a horatory way to finish this up, I, I encourage us to go onwards, fellow cooperators. Let's use the plan for true cooperative socialism and give the world the hope that's on the um, wall of the Ipswich Educational uh, Cooperative Educational Centre which our dearly beloved but now departed Pam Walker um, photographed for me. And it says, and this phrase is so rarely found on Google, that cooperation is the hope of the world. Cooperation is the hope of the world. So thank you fellow cooperators. Um, I invite any com comments or conversations uh, now or in the future. And I certainly hope that you all have a good dinner tonight. Thanks very much, John. Yes, John. Um, right, have we got some questions? If you could uh, please again use the, the raise your hand function. Uh, Rory, I think you were first. Um, yeah, John. Um, just one thing on on clarity. You 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 were making the argument that we're in the new fascism, and you referred to something going on in Australia. I'm I'm, I'm not clear, and I'm not sure if everybody else would be clear what you're referring to going on in Australia. I remember a big government battle with Facebook that might be what you're talking to, but it could be something else. Um, the the other bit of feedback is there's, there's already been quite a lot of um, 
scholars in the field of, of social enterprise that have looked at liminality. So particularly relevant, and she's Australian, is Jo Barraquette. Jo, jo Barraquette has looked at a lot of um, what's going on in liminal spaces, and she's looking at liminal spaces in terms of society rather than the physical environment examples. And I don't know if Roger can remember, but I think Simon Teasdale also picks up this concept of liminal spaces in some of his work. Um, so Joe Barraquette's definitely worth uh, a search for because she's actually historically from the cooperative movement, but kind of got sidelined in Australia uh, through her connection to social enterprise. Um, and Simon will be involved in the new cooperativism um, seminars that are coming up. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry. Um, any... Those leads. Say again? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the leads, Rory. Um, I have a question for you, John. How do you distinguish between social enterprises and socialist enterprises? Uh, I'd love to follow uh, that thinking. Yeah. So um, the, the short answer is that a true cooperative is one that is demonstrably um, conformable to the ICA statement on the cooperative identity. Um, and in 1999, um, the Cooperative Party in this country at Stamford Hall, which was the very last um, occasion that we met there before it was sold, um, endorsed a motion inviting all cooperatives, and this was the exact phrasing, uh, the motion invites all cooperatives to carry out and annually publicise uh, their annual cooperative audits in order to demonstrate their fidelity to the statement on the cooperative identity. Now that resulted in some cherry picking because the statement on the cooperative identity as it presently exists is very challenging. Uh, it includes words like equality, it includes words like solidarity, and uh, it includes as the very last statement and it's really a keynote for this conference uh, the seventh principle which Ian McPherson and fellow cooperators crafted for us which said that cooperatives carry out um, activities approved of by their membership for the sustainable well-being of their communities now that straight away tells us that a true cooperative doesn't simply deliver services to its members, be they housing or retail cooperatives or funeral cooperatives, but it actually delivers uh, that which is beneficial to the entire um, community of humans and non-humans and um, inorganic entities such as the entire planet. So the distinction between a social enterprise as it presently exists, and this is my encouragement to evolve, is that a true socialist enterprise, which is community provided and free at the point of use, is in conformity with the ICA statement. And if a social enterprise is, then why not call it uh, a, a cooperative and recognise that the 19th century cooperators use the word socialist and cooperator interchangeably. In fact, they introduced the word socialist into the English language. I hope that's helpful. Thanks for that clarification. And um, Ian. Hello, John. Good to see you. Hello, Ian. Um, uh, likewise. On your your uh, alert about fascism um i'm less sanguine about that than i was having seen paul mason introduce his new book on fascism in contemporary society which he identifies as being very closely associated with the populist uh, movements across the world and he, he's done quite a lot of research and underneath the populist movements are full-on far-right activists uh, mobilizing at scale 
as we speak. So I think, I, I don't think, uh, I'm inclined to agree with you and I'm inclined to agree with Paul Mason. I, however, I've got a book to show John, I don't know if you'd be able to see it, but I, I was taken with this, this book, which I read it in 2008, just before they um, talked about the SCS conference then, which I can't get in focus. Okay. It's a book by Sheldon we'll Wallin. Um, we'll have to turn off your blurred background, Ian, if you want to show us. Oh, that will show my de desperately untidy room, so I better not do that. I'll, I'll put a note in the in the uh, chat. But it's Democracy Incorporated by Sheldon S. Wallin, Managed Democracy and the Spectre of in Inverted Totalitarianism, which I think is where we're at. I think that we've been in that situation for about the past 10 years, if truth be told. So this idea of inverted totalitarian, where fascism uses uh, violence to uh, sustain its, its power structures, which are very hierarchical, obviously, inverted totalitarian hides behind sort of democratic, pseudo democratic structures, which aren't in fact democratic at all, which, you know, reflects, I think, the situation in the, the co-op group in the UK. So I think, I think, it's, I think it's right that John identifies this and uh, I think we all need to be alert to the undermining of democracy which is happening across the piece especially in the large consumer co-ops in, in the UK. Thanks, well, yes, Ian. Uh, Ian, um, it, shall I respond to Elizabeth or not? Uh, it's Nicola but yes. Sorry Nicola. Um, Apologies. So, um, among, amongst the books next to me is Lawrence um, Goodwin's uh, book, The Populist Moment. Um, and the populist moment relates to what one might call left wing populism, or I would call it agrarian socialism. And that was uh, responsible then for creating the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation in, the, in Canada as a move from the Grange farmers northwards. At that time, um, people were aware of this phrase, uh, the cooperative commonwealth, because of course, in the 19th century, although fascism existed, it wasn't named as such. The reality is that the present demand for compliance is the fascism of contemporary Britain, where in London, the so-called Labour Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has complied with the Marxist woke, which controls every single political activity worldwide. And if somebody wants to rebut me on that, then I'm more than delighted because I want to find genuine community-centred activity to create economic equality. And at the end of the 19th century, the best that could be done was described in Lawrence Grinland's book, uh, The Cooperative Commonwealth in its outlines, an exposition of modern socialism. But by the time you get to university and college texts, here is the third edition of Andrew Hayward's political ideologies. The cooperative option, the true socialism, is not mentioned. But at the end of the 19th century, it was absolutely mentioned. The trade unionists and the others that, that held their rallies in Hyde Park in the 1890s on, on the 1st of May passed motions calling for the establishment of the cooperative commonwealth. So how is it that the woke Marxists, the hobby protesters, the fake left, have managed to co-opt every single space of conversation? I don't know, is the short answer, but I know that's the way it is. And what you said is exactly right, exactly right. That's where we are. And unless we as cooperators act, and I mean promptly, this, this isn't a five year or 10 year project. This is a six month project. Then all protest, all political activity 
even all religious worship in the global Northwest will be utterly suppressed with naked violence. That was the uh, allusion to events in Australia. There are videos of a 12 year old girl going to a grocery shop in Australia, being beaten down to the ground by women and men dressed as paramilitary Rambos because she hadn't worn uh, what they call a mask, what I would call a muzzle, into the grocery shop where she'd been sent to buy some food. Isn't that fascism? Um, Rory, did you have a response to that? So it's, it's a, that's, an, that's a very negative picture, but we only have to remember the paper we had this morning about you know, the recuperated enterprises in Argentina to know that there is genuine community-based community activity that's anti-capitalist and creating worker co-ops uh, in number and at scale. Um, that's awful what's happening in, in Australia. I don't know how to uh, respond to that, but I notice um, I had exactly the same thought as that Grant has just put into the chat. How do you reconcile your argument, and I'm not unsympathetic to your argument for cooperative socialist enterprises, but how do you reconcile that with the official position of um, the Rochdale pioneers to be politically neutral? Well, uh, I'm sure you will accept that the notion of being political, ne politically neutral is deeply political. <laughs> you know, when people say, I don't um, sign up to any isms, then that is a statement of their ism. Yes, um, yes. And as the Pete, Pete Seeger song says, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase the first phrases of it, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Are you the boss's man, man? Are you the boss's man, man? Are you the boss's girl, lass? Are you the boss's girl, lass? That's the question. Which side are we on? Are we on the side of love and peace? Or are we going to collude with a system which assaults? And it's not just Australia. There's, there is an abundance of this fascist Nazi policing behaviour worldwide now. We experienced it in London, I've seen it myself, by the grace of God, literally, because of a rainstorm that descended upon our heads, they would have thrown me to the ground um, beside the Eros statue, the, the statue of love in Piccadilly Circus when I attended a Julian Assange um, rally. You know, and as has been said, first they came uh, for the homosexuals, then they came for the trade unionists, then they came for the Down syndrome kids, then they came for the Jews, and then they came for me. We know this, we know this um, trajectory, and the trajectory has been in low key. I've got a copy of Brassed Off, the film which I thoroughly recommend which we watched at our film co-op in Bromley, um, the, the de-industrialization and the decimation of, of what are called, new phrase to me, the Wise Islands. I don't know if anybody's heard this acronym, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, England, the Wise Islands, I love that. Um, that decimation during the Thatcher years of neoliberal capitalism now of neoconservative capitalism, as Ian has pointed out, they were all faces of, I think even beyond fascism, they were faces of, of outright national socialism as experienced. Uh, Gillian. Right, as uh, those who know me will know, I can't resist when people start talking about religious neutrality. Um, it's something that has been um, misunderstood since the 1860s when it was first put forward. And the Rochdale Pioneers actually put out a notice 
to say what they meant by it. And what they meant by it is really part of open membership because they said it is no business of a cooperative society to ask the politics or religion of its members. It is irrelevant to a cooperative society what those things are. And they should not ask the question because it, it doesn't mean anything. Um, they didn't mean that people wouldn't be political or religious. I mean, some of the Rochdale pioneers were actually lay preachers. Others of them were very political um, going forward. They didn't want cooperation to be taken over by any particular group. And I think that's the whole point, really. And it's the point of what we've, what we've been saying throughout this, this conference that cooperation is bigger than politics and religion. It should be for everybody who wants to take part in it. And I think that's the, that's the key, so. It's good. I mean, you know, Gillian, your comments bring to mind um, Ian McPherson's point. Um, and I, of course I miss Ian, I miss you all seeing you, but you know, our, our now departed from us fellow cooperators, and he pointed out that his understanding of a very challenging cooperative value of self-help was not the Samuel Smiles concept of dragging yourself up by your bootstraps, but self to him was the community. Uh, self didn't imply the individual, it implied the community acting in the way that the Acadians um, in the 18th century refused to be co-opted either into the French fighting forces or the English fighting forces. And as a consequence, um, were deported, men separated from women and children and dispersed around the globe only to gradually come back to Bellevue Cove, which is you know, where my heart absolutely is. So yes, you're right. Understanding our terms and their history is, is pure, pure nourishment, not just simply because I'm an old school teacher. We've got about five minutes left of the session. Are there any last questions to wrap up? No. I would offer I think we've that, got uh, some, uh, Roger. Yes. No, please, Nicola, after you. I was just going to say, uh, John, that there've been some calls for you to end the session with a song. Right. <laughs> um, could I then um, have an indication of whether people would like a song from London or from the United States? Roger suggested Pete, a Pete Seeger song, John. Maybe we could join you in, in the chorus. <laughs> let, let me drag it up. Let me get the proper lyrics because as you will know, Ian, I'm, I'm quite a, an artist at substituting the lyrics that suggest themselves to me rather than the, uh, uh, the actual lyrics. So um, where is my tablet? Do you want me in the meantime to make some final remarks and then close with a <laughs> with a song? <laughs> or great thing there, John. Yeah. You see, I, I have two stock songs. The one from London is the theme tune to a film called Alfie. And and later on after your dinner. On YouTube, there is a spectacular video of Scylla Black singing that at the Abbey Road Studios in London with Burt Bacharach conducting from the piano. And I tell you, when I sing it, I know I cut out half of the lyrics. The one from uh, the United States, which I love, and again, um, he sings the full lyrics um, Nat King Cole 
sings a song called Nature Boy. And again, it's on YouTube. And um, as two statements of what we're trying to achieve, which is a world of love, surely. Isn't that our objective? You know, is there any higher objective than love? Well, uh, I like truth and understanding and knowledge and wisdom and all that merry stuff. But... Um, Ah, there it is. So my, my old tablet is starting up. I shall now ask Mrs. Google for the lyrics for Pete Seeger's yep. song. Say, John, Elizabeth was yep. proposing to do a, a summing, summing up for the conference. And then okay. perhaps take that first while you get your lyrics together. Cool. I'm comfortable with that, uh, Ian. Perfect. That would be the, the best, you know, close for, for the conference, I think. Uh, so <laughs> I just want to, to thank everyone for, for staying with us uh, for either all the three days or part of uh, part of the conference. And uh, I'm very grateful uh, for having uh, had the opportunity to co-chair this conference with uh, Francesca. And I just want to really thank uh, all of the fantastic keynote speakers and presenters from all over the world, really. So we had speakers from Europe, Asia, Africa, Canada, South America, and uh, they provided really, really interesting, engaging presentations about the meaning of our cooperatives, practices, the importance of cooperation, uh, presenting the research and views uh, in different areas and hopefully advancing our knowledge and debate on um, the, you know, that take place within the cooperative movement. Um, as I said earlier, all the recordings will be available online uh, on our website uh, together with the uh, presentations. Uh, so those that have presented, please do uh, send us uh, your slides if you uh, like to me or Francesca. And uh, we will also um, attach the, um, the chat so you can have all the references. Uh, we'll also uh, distribute a survey to receive um, your valuable feedback on how we can improve the conference in the future, which we hope uh, that it will take place around the same time next year. Um, we don't know in what format yet, but uh, hopefully it will be face-to-face -face on a hybrid kind of uh, format. And uh, lastly, I would like to invite all uh, the presenters to submit um, their papers to the journal. So we're going to um, send you an email about uh, putting a special issue together for the, from the conference, or here you can find in the chat box some, uh, the link to uh, our uh, journal. So you can find some more information about uh, submission uh, guidelines for authors, etc. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and to the UK SES uh, committee. I don't know if Francesca wants to say a few words before we give, you know, uh, the stage to John, the virtual one, for a nice closing song. Uh, nothing much to say apart from saying thank you to our colleagues for first staying with us uh, over the conference and joining when, when they could or wanted. Um, and we hope to see you at our next audio conference. Thank you. So, John, the floor is yours. Indeed. Thank you. So, um, the song starts with the chorus which I'm sure you will remember. And the last verse has got the words union and dwell in it. So you'll know when you can escape to get your dinner. <laughs> so if you want to join in at any point, um, the Pete Seeger, which side are you on lyrics is on, uh, in, on Google. So which side are you on boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? They say in Harlan County, there are no neutrals there. 
You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. You could substitute Tony Blair, of course, in there. Or a thug for J.H. Blair. So, chorus. Which side are you on, boys? Which, Which side, side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which, Which side, side are you on? My daddy was a miner and I'm a miner's son. He'll be with you, fellow workers, until this battle's won. Which side Which are you on? on? Which, Which side are you on? on? Which side Which are you on? On workers, can you stand it? Oh, tell me how you can. Will you be a lonely scab, or will you be a man? Which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? Come, all you good workers, good news to you I shall tell of how the good old union has come in here to dwell, of how the good old cooperative has come in here to dwell, of how the good old union and the cooperative have come here to dwell. So, which side Stop are you on? on? Which, which side, side are, are you on? on? Which side are you, are you on, boys? Which side are you on? That's fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Likewise, beloved. All. I love you all to bits. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Happy dinner.